Hi, my name is Tony Armour, and I am the film commissioner here in St. Pete, Clearwater, Florida. I have over 20 years of experience in the industry, from a producer to running a film festival to being film commissioner for the last eight years. And this podcast is the truth about how to get your screenplay or idea made. How to get your screenplay or idea made is a question that I get very, very frequently here at the Film Commission. People think that Film Commission, sometimes it's our job to help you get your stuff made, which to a certain extent that it is, but this is something that we don't really do as far as you know telling you how to make your film or how to make your idea into a project. So what we're going to do here today is kind of go through this workshop that I've put together that's going to hopefully break down and explain to you exactly what it does take to get your idea or screenplay made in today's marketplace. And this is really directed more towards the independent filmmaker, not the studio film, the person who might be just starting out and really has no idea on how to go through this process. So really there are two ways to get your film made. Uh, the first one is you're gonna raise the money yourself hire people to make your project, and the majority of film projects that are made are independently financed. Money typically comes from a, a variety of sources. In a perfect world, somebody just writes one big check and you go make your movie and everything is great. But realistically, that's not really the way things always happen. So you're gonna raise money through crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Seed and Spark. You're gonna spend your own money on a project. You're going to raise money from family and friends, which oftentimes that crowdfunding ends up being the way you're raising money from family and friends. You're going to find investors for your project. You're going to get grants from nonprofits, film festivals, and arts-based agencies. So there are a variety of ways to get your project funded, no matter the genre, no matter what it is you're doing, whether you're doing a documentary or you are doing some sort of narrative storytelling. In order to understand how to get your project made, you need to understand how distribution works. And so hopefully I'm not going to bore you with the dollars and numbers and percentages and the whole business side of getting your project made. But unfortunately, you actually need to know that. It's not just a matter of, well, I have this great idea and I want to make a movie. Why doesn't somebody make it for me? Or, well, I have this great screenplay and I want somebody to just buy the screenplay from me and make it. In today's world, that is a very, very rare thing that doesn't happen. So much of what happens, you have to be very proactive and make things happen for yourself. So I'm going to break down a little bit of distribution, how distribution works, and why you need to know this in order to get your project made. So distribution is different depending on the type of project that is getting done. For example, a studio film. You know, you've got Warner Brothers, Marvel, DC all of the different types of studios that are, that are making projects. And for these large theatrical releases that are anywhere from, you know, thousands of screens, 2,000 to 4,000 screens that a film is getting released on theatrically before it ends up going to streaming. I know streaming is a whole different world now, so we're going to talk about that. Um, these are big budgeted films, anywhere $50 million, $250 million, huge marketing campaigns, you know, Disney and Lionsgate and Fox, these are the projects that the, the big guys are making. Now you've got your, your specialty studios that are doing smaller films, let's say anywhere from the three, five million, $20 million range, uh, moderate number of screens, again, that are gonna get a theatrical release because you're spending this much money on your project. Uh, they have smaller marketing budgets. These are a lot of times your awards caliber films. They're going to play a Sundance or a Tribeca or a Cannes Film Festival, something like that. And, you know, a Focus Features, a used to be Fox Searchlight. Now it's just Searchlight since uh, Disney Company bought Fox. Those smaller independent type of films like that, but are still pretty decently budgeted. Now, again, talking about the streamers, a lot of films in this range are going to get made go to film festivals, and then the streamers pick those up and you'll have some sort of maybe small theatrical run prior to it going to the streaming platform. And that's because they want to do that for awards play. So if you want something to be nominated for an Oscar, you know, it has to play 
in theaters for X number of days before it uh, goes to the streaming platform. So it's eligible for those awards, essentially. But again, it's changing on a daily basis. We put this out here in 2022, and this might change, you know, by next year if the Oscars decides to change the way that they, uh, the way they look at films and what they consider, you know, what's eligible for Oscars. But anyways, you've got those smaller specialty ones. And then you have these truly independent films. So these are films that could be, you know, $50,000 that you and your friends are making at home up to, you know, a couple of million dollar films. And I think that is a lot of what we're talking about here are these truly independent films where you're finding ways to cobble together the financing to put these projects together. E even stuff in that three to $5 million range are really tough to get made right now. Very difficult to get things made in that budget range because just the numbers aren't there as far as what you're going to get paid for that film. Whoever's investing in that film, those distribution numbers aren't there like they used to be because, you know, DVD, Blu-ray sales, that just doesn't exist anymore for, for films. To a small extent, yes, but for the most part, it doesn't. So we're going to delve a little bit more into distribution and why foreign sales matter so much why, you know, the different types of video on demand, you've got AVOD, TVOD, SVOD. If you don't know what any of those things mean, you know, VOD, typically video on demand, AVOD, advertising video on demand, TVOD, transactional video on demand, like an iTunes or Google Play where you're paying, you know, $4.99 or $19.99 for project Amazon as well. SVOD, your subscription platform. So you can have uh, Netflix is a subscription platform, Disney Plus subscription platform. Everybody has a subscription platform now. Peacock, Paramount, and some of them have a sort of a combination of advertising and transactional where you're paying. So it's this whole world of how things get distributed and how money is made determines how people are going to give you money to make your project. Because the big thing about an investor is they want to know how they're going to get their money back before the film is made. Very rarely does somebody just write a check and say, go make your movie, and they're not concerned about getting the money back. If it's a true investment and not a gift, they want the money back, and you have to be able to tell them how they're getting the money back. And you have to be able to tell them that realistically before anybody is going to give you any money for your film. So interestingly, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, that video sales, the DVDs and Blu-rays that used to exist and used to be really big doesn't really exist anymore. Those numbers are still out there. People still buy things on physical media like that. And it still does add quite a bit to the bottom line for a film. But for the most part, these are, you know, the big budget studio release films that are still selling on video like that. The smaller film projects don't generally have that kind of, you know, sell through on, on video. And so we're going to give a, a, just a quick example on a couple of things. So if you take a look at 2019, some of the top numbers in 2019, and there's a website called The Numbers, The Dash Numbers, where you can actually look up all of this data and see this. And that's where I got this information from. So Avengers Endgame sold almost 3 million units for $67.5 million in physical media sales, DVD, Blu-ray. Aquaman, number two, Captain Marvel, Bohemian Rhapsody, Fantastic Beasts, Beast, Crimes of Grindelwald. Those are all, you know, 1.8 million or higher number of units sold in the, in the 40, 50, 60 million dollar range. Well, moving forward, since that was 2019, we all know what happened in 2020 and then how streaming just boomed and took off. And it was such a fast forward for the industry when everyone was basically locked at home or for the most part, people were locked at home. So if you look at 2022, like I said, 2019, the number one film, 2.9 million units sold. 2022, the number one film, Ghostbusters Afterlife, 786,000. So not even a million units sold. So that's $15 million for the number one film, Ghostbusters, when it was $67.5 million in 2019. So it's a huge change in the business model where, hey, $15 million is still a lot of money and studios are still going to be happy to take that money in, but it's not the quantity, quantity of, of money that it was before, which means that there's less money out there because the streamers are not paying that same amount that you're going to be paying or getting for that physical media. So then that trickles down and makes a big difference on what buyers and distributors are going to pay for a film, which means the budgets on the films are dropping as well. And I thought this was really interesting, just looking at 2022. 
you can kind of go down the line and see all the films that are that are out there that are selling a lot of stuff. And again, they're you know Resident Evil and The King's Man and Shang Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings and Adam's Family and Yellowstone season one. And then you go all the way down to the end of the top one hundred list. Number ninety eight on the list is Office Space. The film came out in nineteen ninety nine. And it is still number 98 as far as physical media DVDs being sold in 2022, which is really crazy. 43,000, almost 43,000 DVDs sold for almost $400,000. Really, really wild, considering right above that is Home Alone from like 1993 as well. So I think some of these classic films, some of these cult classic films have really found a life later on because Office Space only did $11 million in theatrical in 1999. And over the last 20 plus years, it's really crushed it on, on that physical media. So just a little aside there and something that I thought was really interesting, but you can kind of look up this information yourself on the-numbers.com. So I'm going to break down a little bit for you, like how a big studio film makes money. And again, I'm delving into this distribution side of stuff because it's important to know how the distribution and how the numbers work in order to know what it requires for you to get your film project made. Maybe you've written this great screenplay that is just this big budget sci-fi epic spectacle. Well, that's an expensive project. How much is that project going to cost and who's going to pay for it? If, if it can only be paid for by a studio because of the size of the budget that you've written, you know, that's a challenge to get to that get to that point. So we're going to delve a little bit more into that. But let's take a, a look at Black Panther. came out in 2018, so we've got a lot of numbers from... 2018 to now showing what that film has done over the years. So this is a film with a 200 plus million dollar budget to get it made. And it has a $200 million marketing budget. So you see the budget of the film, you forget, oh, you got to spend money on marketing as well. And typically for these big studio releases, they're spending just as much money on marketing as they spent to actually make the project. So, and again, these numbers are rough estimates. I didn't call anybody up at Disney and say, hey, how much did you uh, spend making uh, Black Panther? Some of this number is readily available. You can find this information online, and others are estimated numbers based on, you know, what I know about the industry and how the industry works. So you're talking, you know, roughly $400 million just to put the film out. Well, over $1.3 billion box office. Huge number. We're talking, you know, B with a billion. That's a ton of money. But what you forget, though, is that that $1.348 billion that it makes at the box office, Disney doesn't keep all of that. The theaters actually keep a percentage of that as well. And so it's scalable. You know, at first, that first weekend when a film comes out, you know, it's negotiated between Disney and theaters. And maybe, you know, Disney's keeping 70% of the money that theaters get in 30%. Theaters are making money on popcorn and everything else that they sell. And then the longer that film stays out, then the more money the theater keeps every week. So it might start out with 70% to Disney, and then it starts moving. And at some point in time, Disney is getting 30%, and the theater is getting 70%. This used to be what they would call when a film was held over. So for those of you young enough or old enough to remember, you know, a film would come out in theaters, and it would have a certain run say it was four weeks or something like that and then they would hold it over and play it another week and another week and another week and so they would advertise that a film was held over and it would continue to play and play and play back you know in the 70s and 80s you had star wars films indiana jones films those films would be at the theaters for a year i mean an entire year where these movies are playing in theaters and they just kept going and going and going so let's just say that 50% of the money is going to Disney and 50% is going to the theaters. China, don't forget about China. China has been a big a big theatrical market, but China actually, by law, the Chinese theaters keep 75% of the money and then the studios only get 25%. And I think it's only like 34, 35 films a year, something like that, are allowed to be released in China. We won't go into the whole politics of China and Disney and the way that big corporations bend over backwards to appease the Chinese censors and government just so they can have theatrical releases in those companies, in, those, in that country. Um, so let's call it $674 million is half of that box office, minus your $400 million cost. Well, $274 million profit from box office on $1.3 billion. That's, a, that's a, big, a big drop if you think about it. That's how much it takes to actually make money. Throw in some other costs, some distribution costs, profit and participation fees that are going to actors and producers and directors and everybody else. Uh, 
you know, so now you call that a hundred million dollars. So now you're down to $174 million on a $1.3 billion box office. Now, granted, let's talk about the DVD and the Blu-ray and all that. It made $104 million on Blu-ray and DVD. You're going to get tax credits because it's shot in the state of Georgia. And so you're getting 25% back for what it's shot in Georgia. So, you know, that number could be, you know, $30 million that you're getting back from the state of Georgia that goes to the project, which again is why incentives are so important in states as well. And not only do they shoot in Georgia, but then if they do, oh, we're going to do post-production Canada, we're going to do post-production New York, you can sprinkle your post-production around to these different areas where you get reimbursed for doing post-production as well and getting millions and millions of dollars back from governments for bringing business to those areas throw on top of that you know toys and stuffed animals and lunch boxes and whatever else you can think of that they're that they're making associated with black panther and trust me disney's not losing any money but the the financials there are not what you think they are when you see 1.3 billion dollars box off it doesn't mean disney puts 1.3 billion in their pocket because there's a lot of expenses and things that get spread out everywhere so i just wanted to break that down for you and talk a little bit about how those studio films make money so that you can understand how difficult it is to get a project made and to get it actually funded so something that you're going to hear from investors if you're talking to them about actually putting money into your film whether it's your screenplay that you're producing or that you wrote or your idea, whatever it is, is the waterfall. What's the waterfall? And the waterfall, you know, a waterfall starts and falls, is basically, you know, who are the profit participants and how does that money fall and break down for everyone that is involved in the project? Where is that money going? And how is it going to get distributed when profits start coming in for the project? So Stephen Follows, who is probably the preeminent and maybe one of the only data analysts in the film industry has a website, Steve, uh, stephenfollows.com, where he really breaks down all this information, has a lot of great articles and charts and data. Guy's amazing. I would highly recommend going to his website, checking things out, and you can really learn about a lot about the industry and, and why things are made the way that they are, and why things are marketed the way they are, and how things are sold, basically. So really valuable information, and that's where I got a lot of these statistics and information from, basically. But if you look at the waterfall for a $30 million feature film that grosses $75 million worldwide. And these numbers are a little skewed nowadays because nobody's making $30 million films anymore. You know, $30 million film is now something that Netflix makes and puts out directly on that platform. But we're still going to talk theatrical a little bit because everyone still wants to see their film, you know, go theatrical. It's still kind of a thing as a filmmaker, a goal that everybody wants. So I talked about before those P&A costs, print and advertising costs. So, you know, you've got $35 million in P&A costs. You've got distribution fees of $15 million. Your sales agent, the company and the people that actually have to sell your film and get it out there, there's $100,000 in costs. There's a sales agent fee. They're taking $7.8 million off that $75 million. You got your original budget of $30 million. By the time you break this all down and trickle everything down, you only have $3.5 million left out of your $78 million. Well, guess what? Investors you know, get their percentage of profits. And then anything that comes back to everybody else who worked on the film breaks down about $1.7 million. So again, this is just a, an estimate for, you know, a mystical $30 million film that makes $75 million worldwide theatrical. It brings in another 18 million in home entertainment, another 28 million in television, some VOD money and other ancillary ancillary money. So it's a profitable film, but the money that actually trickles down to the people that are a part of that film is is very very small because that money has to go everywhere else to make sure that everybody's paid back for making this thing. But let's let's kind of break it down a little bit smaller and now we're going to really talk about the independent film. You're you're an independent filmmaker, you've got this idea you want to get your film made, you you've got this screenplay that you want to get made. How do you realistic really realistically really get your project done? How do you really really get it out there and get it made? All right. More business stuff because again, that's how this is how your film gets made is the business side of it. As the uh, as the old saying goes, it's not show art, it's show business. So, tax credits, film incentives, hugely important. Anytime somebody is making a film, that is what they are looking at on why something is going to get made in a particular area or a particular location. So, I'm going to use the state of Florida as an example right now. So, the state of Florida has nothing. We got no tax credits, no film incentives in the state whatsoever. We did have a great incentive program from 2010 to 2016, and in that time frame, we had a lot of stuff that shot here in the state. 
We had the Burn Notice TV series shooting in Miami, multiple other TV series that shot around the state. Just in the Tampa Bay area here, Magic Mike and Spring Breakers and the Dolphin Tail films, which were $20 million films that shot here in Clearwater and then you know made $100 million at the box office. So the reason those films got made here in the state of Florida is because of that state tax incentive. Well, take that state tax incentive away, we haven't had a big film shoot here like that. We had... Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, huge film, Tim Burton made, shot here in the area, but they shot for a week, and then they left. They came for a week because we had a local incentive, and they used that local incentive to be able to get a little bit of money before they went to the UK and then shot the rest of the film. Same thing with The Infiltrator, Brian Cranston film, that shot here for you know a week to 10 days, got a local incentive to be able to shoot the little bit that was here, and then shot the rest of the stuff that takes place in Florida in the UK, again, because they get that big tax incentive there. So you bring that down even to smaller films, that still makes a big difference. Whether it's Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, we're going to pop up a map on the screen here. We'll show you a map of the entire United States and, sh and take a look at this map and see all of the different states and areas that have tax incentives, tax credits, tax rebate programs. Won't delve too much into that, other than it's very important for investors because that is free money that they're getting back on their film, and that helps them make sure that they're going to get their money back. And they're not going to put money into your film unless they know they're going to get that money back. So we were talking about the amazing world of tax credits and why that is so important for you as the creative person to be able to get your screenplay or idea made. Well, as we had talked about, they're necessary when it comes to getting what you need done basically for your project so that an investor will actually give you money for your film. Another big component is foreign sales. Foreign sales, what does that mean? Well, foreign sales are vitally important because for an independent film, the way that a project actually gets made and financed is nothing to do with theatrical. That theatrical number is really for studio films only. It just doesn't mean anything when you talk about the small foreign films. When you talk about the actual business of getting films made, there are something like 50 international territories around the world, and your film has to be sold individually in each one of these territories by a sales company in order for you to get the money back for the investor. Typically, the way that foreign sales work is that you're going to license your film in a territory for anywhere from five to 10 years. And that territory is going to pay an agreed upon licensing fee called a minimum guarantee. So let's say we've made film XYZ and film XYZ is a $3 million action film and we're super excited to get it out there in the world. Well, how do you make your money back on that film? Very rarely does somebody just come in and say, we're going to give you $4 million for your $3 million film. There you go. Pay everybody back. Moving on to the next project. Sometimes you get a worldwide deal. Sometimes you don't. But in all of those cases, you have to have a sales agent, a sales company, whose job it is to sell your film in those territories. So you've got Film XYZ. You've got a $3 million budget. They're going to sell... $500,000 in the UK, they're going to sell $300,000 in Germany, they're going to sell $200,000 in France. You're literally nickeling and diming and selling all these individual territories around the world to try and equal more than your $3 million budget to pay your film back and so that everybody makes money on the project, basically. So a big part of this sales world is the pre-sales, pre-sales, the pre-selling of a film. Pre-selling a film means that you're actually selling a movie before it has been made. You know what the genre is, what it's about, who the cast is in the film, and then you start taking it out into the world and say, how much would you give me for film XYZ with Brad Pitt and Tony Armour and so-and-so directing this film? And then sales companies come back and they say, we'll give you this much money for this territory, this much for this territory, this much for this territory. So we're going to break down a few numbers here on a few different films where we actually have pre-sales, budgets, and total sales for these projects. So we're going to go over a few examples of films that have been made and kind of go over their budget, their pre-sales, their total sales, tax credit numbers, super exciting stuff that you don't care anything about. But again, you need to know this. If you actually want to get your project made, you need to know the business side, not just the creative side. So let's take a look at these four films right here. A couple of these films you probably have never even heard of, but that's generally how the industry works. There are so many films that are made on a yearly basis, you don't hear about most of them. So we've got Life After Beth. 
comedy film with a two and a half million dollar budget that had four and a half, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in pre-sales, total sales of four point two million dollars. It made more than its money back in that two point five million. Everybody's happy. You've got Dom Hemingway, five and a half million dollar budget with a million dollars in pre-sales and another four point seven seven million in total sales. You've got Chef. Now, Chef was a, a film with John Favreau, and it had Scarlett Johansson and Robert Downey Jr., and so it had this huge cast in it because John Favreau basically called everybody up and said, hey, will you be in my movie? And they're all friends, and so they did his movie. So it made this little movie for $8 million, and it did actually well at the box office. It's been on streaming, did really well, but they were able to get $4.7 million in pre-sales because you had all these great names in this film and then another $10 million on sales on top of that. And then this comedy, Are You Here, that has Owen Wilson, Zach Galifianakis, and Amy Poehler in it, $10 million budget, small pre-sale number, but it was able to do a lot more in sales, $7 million sales, and then a big tax credit number as well. And so that's how that, that film ended up making money. So I'm not going to delve too much into these spreadsheets here because it will really bore the hell out of you. But something important to note and just kind of look at is look at a list of all the different territories. You've got you know, North America, U.S. and Canada. You've got your English-speaking territories, Europe. And you can see what the sales companies are asking for, that ask number. This is that number that we want and what they will actually take. And then what the percentage of the budget is. So again, this is important because you kind of need to know how does a film make money? Where does it come from? And this is how it makes money is it's broken down into all of these different territories where the film is licensed and sold and that's how it actually makes money and you, you can break down there's asia there's middle east there's eastern europe you know latin america ancillary like airlines so every little bit makes a difference when it comes to a film making money and you need to know this because you need to know what you're going to put together so that your film can actually get made again dom hemingway Breaking that film down, Jude Law, Amelia Clark, Clark, big names in that in that particular film for a little independent film. You can see what that in the green, the pre-sale, the MG, that minimum guarantee that they get prior to actually making the movie that helps get the movie made. So not going to bore you again with all these numbers. You can take a look at them. You know later on we'll have this uh, these screens and these uh, these available to look at. Um, but really, selling a film comes down to selling it at these four major film markets that happen around the world every year. So film markets are not just film festivals, but they are markets where a film gets bought and sold, basically. It's literally a trade show. It's a convention where filmmakers and sales companies and producers and studios get together and they do the buying of selling all the films in those territories that you just saw on all those spreadsheets. So the first one that takes place every year is the European film market in Berlin. Now, the European film market in Berlin matches up with the Berlin Film Festival, the Berlinale. So you've got this festival, and then you've got the market that takes place at the same time. And then probably the most famous film festival in the world is the Cannes Film Festival. It takes place in May of every year. But what people don't realize is the Marché du Film, or the market of film, translation from French, about the only French that I, that I speak is Marché du Film. Uh, that is the largest film market in the entire world. You literally walk into this convention center and it is just tables and booths set up with all of these companies selling and buying movies. There's the posters and there are the monitors with you know, trailers running and buyers from all these different countries walking around and seeing, you know, what do you have? You know, they'll come into a sales booth and be like, I am looking for a boxing film. They're looking at your posters, looking at trailers. Do you have a, you have a boxing film uh, maybe available? So, you know what? I don't have a boxing film, but I've got a karate film. Would you be interested in karate or maybe an MMA or something like that? Well, yeah, why don't you show me your MMA or your karate film? This is literally how it works. It's literally like going grocery shopping. That is how films are bought and sold and how they're made. And the artistic side of it, while important to the filmmaker, when it comes to the business side of it, these people are just number crunchers and they're looking at looking at things to fill. You know, they have a calendar and on their calendar every week they've got to be putting out a new film, a new product every week for people to watch. People are watching so much stuff now, consuming so much content. Everybody's favorite word, content. What kind of content are you creating? Well, we're creating some content right here, right now. This is a podcast. What amazing content we're making. Uh, and so I don't know what that voice was or who that was supposed to be, but somebody who likes to talk about content, apparently. Not me. And so, uh, you know, you have all these films that are, that are bought and sold, and they're literally just calendars that have to be, that have to be filled with, with product every week. The film or the show or whatever's come out is product. And so after Marche du Film, 
in conjunction with the Cannes Film Festival in May. You have the Toronto Film Festival takes place in, in September, and they have the film market at the Toronto Film Festival. And then the last one every year is the American Film Market in Santa Monica every November, and that does not have any sort of festival associated with it at all. It's literally just a straight-up market at the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica. So the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica always has been very interesting during AFM. It used to be that you could get into the lobby of the hotel and you didn't have to have a, uh, a badge or have paid for you know registration to attend. They've changed that now. And so you, it used to be that you would walk into the lobby of the Lowe's Hotel and you could just tell there are people they were just holding – their, their scripts or their or their DVDs or whatever it is, and they're looking. And they don't look you in the eyes, but they, they're looking right about belly level because they want to see your badge, and they want to see who you are. Like, who is this? Who is this person? Everybody's squinting and looking at your belly uh, because they want to know, you know, is this a producer? Is this a buyer? Who can I pitch my project to? People would just be walking around or, or hanging out at the bar, you know, waiting to pitch somebody. And you, God forbid you just sit down and you want to order a beer at the bar, and somebody will just kind of come up next to you and be like, hi, how are you? What's your name? Are you a producer? Would you like to make my movie? And it's a very strange, very strange kind of environment like that. But it was always a little, a little fun at the, uh, at the same time. So let's talk about your independent film. How much is it going to cost? How much do you need to actually make your movie? And how do you get that money? That's the biggest question I think everyone always has is, well, how do I get the money? You know, when you, when you say, I have this idea or this screenplay, how do I get it made? The question you're really asking is, how do I get the money to get this movie made? How do I find this cash? Well, there's a couple of ways, like we started talking about in part one. You could be the children of Larry Ellison, the Oracle uh, creator, uh, uh, Megan Ellison and David Ellison, I think, are the two kids. Wow, they're the children of billionaires. So daddy just writes them a big check. They start their own companies, and now they have, you know, Annapurna Pictures and go out there and produce all this great stuff. Since most of us are not the children of billionaires, there are different ways that you have to go about trying to get your movie made. But let's talk about how this breaks down. So if somebody's going to invest in your film, we're going to really drill down on this, on this slide right here. Someone is investing in your film. That investor owns 50% of your film. They also, whatever they're putting in, there's some sort of ROI that they want, a return on investment. So if I'm putting $100,000 into the film, I want anywhere from 10, 20% back on top of that $100,000 as profit because people don't invest to lose money or to break even. They invest because they want to make money. And people forget sometimes about the time value of money. And again, not to delve too, too deep into finance here, but if somebody gives you $100,000 for something and it takes them two years to get their money back, more than likely they could have done something else with that $100,000 over the last two years, whether it's stock market or real estate investing or some other investment, whatever it might be, in order to make that 10 or 15% that they want to make on a film. So in a lot of cases, people aren't necessarily investing in film just because they think they're going to make money. They're really doing it because they're passionate, because they want to be involved in film in some way, and they want to make money on top of that. And again, investor translates into wanting to make money, not lose money, or just break even, because money is never free. If anybody knows of free money out there, please let us all know, because that's, uh, that's something that doesn't usually exist. So you're making your film, your investor owns 50% of the film, they're getting that anywhere from 10, 15, 20% return on their investment. The person or the company that's selling your film, the sales agent, they're going to charge anywhere from what could be a 5, 10, 15, or 20% sales fee. And then there's also a marketing fee that they're going to charge based on the budget of your film. So a marketing fee, what is, what is that? Why is a sales company getting a marketing film? Well, they have a lot of work to do when it comes to putting together, you know, posters and artwork and trailers or just going and traveling to these different sales markets. You know, the sales markets have gone sort of hybrid and virtual in the last couple of years, so you don't have to necessarily travel, but so much business just get does just get done because you're because you're there. So, you know, again, I'll use Marche du Film as an example. Well, it costs to fly to France and get a hotel and then get set up for the trade show booth. And so maybe they're selling anywhere from you know, five, 10 or 20 films. And each one of those films are getting some sort of marketing fee. And that fee is paying for that travel and that booth and everything that they're setting up. And they're not charging you for that upfront. That comes from the sales that they make on the film. So, you know, when a sales agent or sales company takes on your film, they are making money only if they sell the project. 
which, you know, they're putting faith in that they like this project and they think they're going to make money on it. So they have to make money as well. Again, money is usually not free. So they get a, a sales commission fee for selling the film and then they get a marketing fee as well. So we're going to talk about a $1.5 million budget film. Let's say you've got your $1.5 million budget film. Your investors get their investment back plus their 15%. The sales agent does a great job selling this film and they sell $2 million dollars in domestic and international sales. So you got $2, $2 million in sales. Great. They got their $100,000 marketing fee off of that. They're going to take their 15% sales fee. So there's another $400,000 that comes off of that. That comes down to $1.5 million now. So you've sold $2 million. Well, $500,000 is already gone to the sales company. The investors, of course, have to get their $1.5 million back. So investors get their $1.5 million back. Well, you still owe the investors their 15% fee of $300,000. Well, hopefully you've shot in a state or an area where you're going to get some sort of incentive. You, let's say you get a 20% incentive and you're getting $300,000 back. So the investors are super happy. The investors got their $1.5 million back. They got their 15% uh, fee on top of that. They got their $300,000. And guess what? There's no money left. So you, as the filmmaker, film was sold for $2 million on your $1.5 million budget. You made whatever you made for your screenwriting fee, your directing fee, your producer fee, whatever it might be. So there's no money left on the back end for you to actually get anything. Now, the film may continue to sell over years and years and years, and so some of that money may come in. As that money comes in, you'll get something. But this is really very realistic when it comes to what the numbers are for you getting your film distributed and, and how much money there actually is to be made. There are different things you can do. Sales agents can lower their fees. You can They can defer part of their fees until the investors recoup their investment first. There's a variety of things. But whatever the budget of your, your film is, basically the sales and the incentives need to be 150% or more of the budget in order for break-even to happen. So, you know, selling $1.5 million on a $1.5 million film means that you've lost money. You've got to make money above your budget by about 150% in order for break even, essentially. Nature of the business. Now, talking about those distribution fees, I'm not going to bore you too much with all this. So hopefully, you know, you're following along and being able to keep this pretty well. And I know you're saying, when are you going to just tell me how to get my film made? This is telling you how to get your film made. You got to know this in order to figure out how to get your movie made. So again, average distribution fees, Take a look at this slide here. Your sales agent, your U.S. distributor, international distributor, the cinema, the movie theater, you know, where the money comes from, commissions, production. You can kind of take a look at this and go to Stephen Follows. Again, stephenfollows.com, great data there. That's where I got this information from. Really dig in and, and learn a little bit more about how distribution and all these sales fees work. Financing details. Again, you know, I'm going to leave this slide up here so you can take a look at this, pause it. You can really read this and kind of study a little bit and figure out, you know, where the money goes for your film. I just talked about a $1.5 million film. This is talking a little bit about a $1 million film. You know, what's the budget? It, how much money is coming in equity? How much coming money is coming in in pre-sales? How much money might be coming in tax credits? All of this stuff put together helps fund your film. Basically, you know, if your if your budget is $1 million, if somebody just wants to write a million dollars, great, write a check, make the movie, but realistically, that's not typically how it gets done. People are going to be putting in a little bit of money and then basically financing tax credits and pre-sales by getting loans against those amounts to, uh, to get things made. So leave this up. You can take a little more look at it, ask some questions in the comments here, and, you know, let us know what you think. Again, misconceptions about theatrical. We kind of went over the theatrical breakdown a little bit earlier. It's another slide for you to look at. Go to stephenfollows.com. Check out this information. You can see... Again, more of what this means with theatrical. A lot of times theatrical films lose money because it is so expensive to put things out theatrical, which is why streaming is so important right now. But streaming numbers are not that high. You're just not getting paid that much money. I know everybody wants to be on Netflix. I just want a movie on Netflix. Well, Netflix really doesn't pay that much. So sometimes I know a, a film investor who has a film that he was happy the film did not go to Netflix because Netflix was not going to pay the money that this film needed in order to get uh, to get its money back and so they find other ways it goes to hbo it goes on video on demand you make more money on video on demand than you going to a streaming platform like a netflix okay so now we're going to talk about option number two 
all of that was really a breakdown of kind of option number one for getting your movie made. And then, a, you know, a distribution finance breakdown, exactly what you wanted to see today. But option number two, a production company, a producer, a studio, somebody just reads your screenplay or loves your project and just wants to make this thing. But how do you get to that point? How do you actually get that to happen to get your project made? You know, what if you don't have a script and you just got an idea and you just, you know, I have this idea. How do I get that made? Where do film and TV series come from? You've got established writers who've been in the industry who have those connections where they have representation agents and managers that can call up production companies and pitch these projects. You've got the established production companies, Warner Brothers Television, Sony Television, and again, we won't delve too much into the breaking down of these large corporations and how they work, but they have their feature film divisions, they have their television divisions, and so on down the line. Web series, podcasts, social media, books, that is actually where a lot of stuff comes into play nowadays. You know, IP, intellectual property, another buzzword that everybody loves to say, where do you find this IP? You know, people are constantly optioning web series and podcasts and finding things on social media and books. A lot of books basically are now being optioned for projects before they're even published. So publishers are actually going out there and actively trying to bring in option agreements for projects or books that will be released just based on the fact that something's going to happen. You'll see uh, news articles a lot. You know, if you can get an article in Rolling Stone, uh, Rolling Stone is actually a pretty good way. There's always something that seems like it's being optioned from Rolling Stone that somebody wrote that they're going to turn into some unique or interesting film or television show or, or story, basically. Reboots. Reboots are reboots. You know, constantly rebooting things and finding ways to, uh, to do reboots. Screenplay contests, uh, websites, and spec scripts, just your speculative script and your original concept that you've written. You know, that's, these are all sort of the different ways where these ideas and, and projects come from. And after going through all of this, after telling you how all this works, he's like, I don't want to be a producer. I just, I just have this script that I wrote. I just want you to make it. Can somebody just please make this for me? Someone just make my movie. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but that is a very, very, very rare thing, and it just doesn't happen. You know, there's that, uh, that old saying that uh, God helps those who help themselves. You have to help yourself, and it requires a, a lot of work. To, to get your stuff made. Sometimes it's just not about how good it is. Something could be the best screenplay or the best idea ever made, and it doesn't matter because that's not how things get made in Hollywood as far as projects. So a big thing, you know, in Hollywood and in the, in the industry is they don't know you. You know, they don't know who you are. They don't know who I am. I, you know, know people a little bit, but for, for, you know, for the most part, you know, people don't know you. They don't know who you are. And so why would they work with you if they don't know you. You know, people work with who they who they know and who they trust and who they've worked with in the past. And so the question is, how do you break into that and become someone that they know and they worked with and, you know, you've done things in the past? Uh, you know, it used to be the attitude was, well, if you're serious, you're going to move to Los Angeles and you're going to, you know, rent a room and sleep on a couch and have room, four roommates and eat ramen noodles like I did. The world has changed a little bit. You don't necessarily have to live in L.A. Matter of fact, a lot of people are moving away from L.A., and New York, you know, since 2020, but that still is kind of very much an attitude for a lot of people within the industry. And, you know, why should they talk to you? Why should they look at your script? Who are you? I don't know you. You know, they don't take unsolicited submissions so often. And so that's why, you know, you, uh, you have to kind of get out there and find these other ways to get your projects or your ideas noticed. So, you know, a big agency is going to get, let's call it a hundred calls per day or a hundred emails per day from, you know, unknown people not in the industry. And again, that's let's say that's 36,500 script inquiry calls per year. And then how many more emails on top of that? There's no way anybody could manage that. So they just, the policy is no unsolicited submissions whatsoever. People try and find creative ways to get people their scripts, but something that people in Hollywood hate doing, and this sounds like the opposite of the way it should be, nobody likes to read a script. Everybody hates reading scripts very strange, but they'll have assistants read it. They'll then have the assistants write up coverage. And this is somebody straight out of college that, you know, happens to be an assistant at the office and they're relying on that an assistant's position on the script to decide whether it should be, whether it should be read or not. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting thing. So how do you get people's attention? Are you, what are you doing to improve your, your writing? Are you taking screenwriting classes? Are you in a screenwriting group? 
Uh, have you gone through these screenwriting books and really honed your craft? You know, how good is the project that you're working on? How much work have you done to, to, achieve, to achieve this? You can get professional coverage on your screenplays. This is a huge help. You know, you've written something and you want somebody besides your mom and your friends to read this screenplay and tell you if it's good or not. So there are a lot of different services out there. Screencraft is really great. That's one that I use frequently, and I really like that for the projects that, that I've written. You know, they, you get coverage. There are competitions where you can get fellowships. There are contests. You know, the blacklist is something that, you know, people put their screenplays up on there. And people are looking for projects on the blacklist. Final Draft has contests, Blue Cat, Ink Tip. You know, the Academy's Nichols Fellowship, which is – you know, probably the number one screenwriting contest in the world. If you place in the Academy Nickel Fellowship, well, then, you know, someone is going to read your screenplay and it very possibly get made. You know, Sundance has labs. Warner Brothers has TV writers workshops. They're a film independent lab. There's so many different workshops and labs and things out there for undiscovered and unknown writers that you've just got to keep working to kind of get your stuff out there. Now, I know there are some very established writers in the industry. I love listening to the Script Notes podcast, and I believe it's Craig Mason on that podcast that will say, you know, screenwriting, screenwriting contests are worthless. They don't mean anything. You, you know, you're not going to get anything out of these. To a certain extent, you know, you can agree with that, but at the same time, to be able to say, hey, you know, I placed in the Academy Nichols Fellowship, or I was number one or a finalist in these screenwriting contests, it just gives you a leg up and a reason for somebody to actually read your screenplay as opposed to, you know, just throw it in that pile that they got in the corner, you know, either physically or metaphorically speaking into their you know, folder on their, on their hard drive of all the PDFs that they're getting of, getting of screenplays. A massive thing that you can do to help yourself to get your idea or screenplay made is networking. You actually need to know people, right? So a lot of times it's not what you know, it's who you know, and how do you get to know people within the industry? Film festivals. I think film festivals are probably the number one way to really get out there and to meet people within the industry. This is not saying you have to fly to Cannes every year and go to American Film Market or go to, you know, Tribeca or all the Sundance or all these festivals. You've got regional or local festivals wherever you live. Just about every state or area in the country has some sort of film festival or something happening. I think there are 9,000 film festivals on Film Freeway, which Film Freeway is the film festival platform where basically most film festivals around the world are are using that platform to accept films for their festivals. So 9,000 film festivals. So go to your local film festival and just hang out for the weekend and talk to people and meet people and see what they're working on and, you know, end up working on a short film with somebody and then that turns into something else and turns into something else. You know, really film festivals have been the number one way that I've met people in the industry and been able to develop my career over the last uh, 20 years. There are conferences, uh, like I talked about with the uh, Marche du Film and the film markets. You know, you've got different writers' conferences. The Austin Film Festival, while it's still a film festival, is actually a huge writers' festival as well. So they have screenwriting contests, and there are major screenwriters that are doing workshops and, and people that are there at, at Austin. And a lot of content gets produced from projects that make it through the Austin Film Festival. Well, and a big thing, another big thing to uh, not forget about is don't forget to keep writing. So just because you have that one screenplay that you love, that you're trying to get made, what else do you have? So many conversations in the industry, somebody might read something or really like the concept of something you got, and they'd be like, oh, that's really cool, but you know what? I actually have something similar to that that we're doing, and don't think that your project is the most unique only thing like that that's ever been created. There are so many projects out there that are similar to what you're doing. You always want to have a what else you got in your back pocket so that you can continue to, you know, develop and do other things. So keep, keep writing. Now I know, you know, I'm really focusing this towards writing. So people that have screenplays or things that they've written that they've written and you might just have your idea. So having your idea, how do I get this idea made? Well, that script is the next thing. You've got to have a script for anybody to really consider doing anything with your idea. So it has to be more than just an idea. You have to, if you have that idea, you've got to find a way to turn it into a screenplay. And again, that goes back to how do you meet these people? How do you meet writers? How do you do these things? Find a way to write it yourself. Start learning how to write it yourself. You know, be proactive. So what next? So what can you really do to help get your screenplay or idea made? Well, a big thing right now that 
everybody wants to see, whether it's an investor or a studio or a production company or anybody that wants to make something, is a proof of concept. What is this actually going to be like? What is the tone like? What's it going to look like? So shooting a proof of concept, whether that is just a short film or a trailer or something that shows what you're going to be making, what this story really is. So proof of concepts are what everybody is doing right now. Proof of concepts are how things are actually getting made because, again, proof of concept, it shows what your idea, what your screenplay could potentially be. Now, a big thing with the proof of concept is, you know, don't go out and spend $50,000, $100,000 shooting your proof of concept something. You know, try and keep the budget manageable, reasonable for whatever whatever you're doing, whatever you're shooting. You know, they want to see what it could be. They want to see that it's good. You know, make it as good as it can possibly be. I know that goes without saying, well, of course I'm going to make it good. But no, really, you've got to make it good. Because if you make your proof of concept and it's meh or not so good, well, then they're going to assume that that's what the feature film is going to be, even though it's going to be a much bigger budget. Is like, well, the proof of concept was meh. So not really interested in... In, in making the full-length version of me, You know, film festivals, again, going back to festivals, if you can have that proof of concept, win some awards at festivals, play a lot of film festivals, people see that and be like, wow, okay, people really like this proof of concept. They really like what this is. Now, again, it should be something that stands out independently on its own if you're making a short film. You know, you're not going to try and compress 90 minutes into a six-minute short film. You want to show one particular scene or just something that's going to get the tone across and what your story really is for that for that proof of concept. There are a lot of examples of proof of concepts that have been turned into feature films out there. So there's a great article uh, on Raindance on seven short films that were turned into feature films. You can just do a Google shorts made into features and you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff that pops up. Short films being made into feature films is very big. Proof of concept, that's what people want to see. So kind of recapping and talking a little bit about everything that needs to get done here. You know, you want to be proactive. Are you getting coverage on your screenplays to make sure that they're as good as they can be? Are you going out there networking? Are you putting your screenplay into contests? I know contests and film festivals can get expensive because there are screenwriting competitions for festivals, so you don't want to maybe spend a ton of money on out there, but it's a way to get people to read your your screenplay and see, you know, what it is that you're doing. Are you taking classes? Are you reading books? Anything that you can do to constantly improve your screenwriting and what you're doing and keep writing, keep writing multiple, multiple projects. You know, be good at what you're doing. Listen to the feedback. If you get feedback from, you know, multiple coverage uh, companies or individuals that you know that you trust and they're telling you that there are things that need to be changed and you're saying, nope, the screenplay is perfect how it is. I'm not saying you have to listen to every bit of coverage or every bit of feedback that you get, but... If a lot of people are saying the same thing about your screenplay or your idea, then maybe they have something a little there. Be willing to take any kind of constructive criticism that can help make your project uh, better, basically. You know, make those changes. Shoot that proof of concept. You know, try and win some awards. It sounds really easy, right? Just go win some awards. Or you're just going to go be an award winner. Not everybody, of course, is going to do that. Not every project is going to go win awards. But try and, you know, get a little notoriety. Get, uh, get a little known for whatever it is that you've, uh, that you've done that you're creating. Again, networking, being collaborative. Film is a collaborative industry. You're not going to be able to do it entirely by yourself. So who do you want to work with? Find those people that you want to work with. Try not to be you know, selfish and try and do it all yourself. You need to be able to get out there and network and, and work with people and be collaborative. There are some great articles in uh, Movie, Mag Magazine, Mag Movie Maker Magazine, Flipping the Script, How to Navigate the Ups and Downs of the Spec Script Market, NoFilmSchool.com has a lot of great information as well about screenplays. NoFilmSchool.com actually has a great uh, grant article that they put out every six months or so. It'll be, you know, here are the best documentary film grants of the last six months. Here are the best, you know, short film grants or feature film grants. And they'll list hundreds of grants that you can apply for to get that free money to get your to get your project made, basically. So don't be afraid to apply for grants and try and try and get grants and get things done that way. So I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples on, you know, not to discourage you on what it really takes to get a project made and why sometimes it takes so long. So Samuel Jackson, right? I think everybody knows who Samuel Jackson is. Don't need to explain or, you know, read off his bio or his IMDb page on what Samuel L. Jackson has done over the years. Well, 2022, he has a TV series now on Apple Plus called The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray. 
So I listened to a great article or a great interview with uh, Samuel L. Jackson the other day talking about this particular series. I've not watched the series yet, but just from listening to him talk about it, it makes me want to check it out. Well, he said it took him nine years to get this project made. This is Samuel L., insert the word that he likes to use a lot, Jackson, and it took him nine years to get his project made. You know, why does it take Samuel L. Jackson nine years to get his TV series made? Well, because, again, it's not easy. Just because there's something that he has that he likes that he wants to do, there's a process that has to be gone through of trying to find somebody who wants to make your film. You know, he's been in the industry a long time. He's got agents. He's got managers. He's got, you know, his name recognition, and it still took him nine years to get a project made. So if it's taken you some time to get a project made, you know, don't become too frustrated. Just realize that things take time within this industry in order to get done. So I guess the whole point then of, you know, how do you get your screenplay or idea made is put in the work, do the different things that you can do from proof of concept to screenplay contest to networking to meeting the right people and continue to work on other stuff because you never know when something else is going to pop up and get something made. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this answers your question on how to get your screenplay or idea made. Ask some questions in the comments here, and we'll be happy to answer them and give you as much information as we possibly can. Thank you for watching. I'm Tony Armour, Film Commissioner for St. Pete Clearwater, Florida. Come shoot your next movie right here in beautiful St. Pete Clearwater.